On the track is a monthly web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. Stagecoach for free, not yet anyway. But I would like to say, my name is John Downs, and welcome to another episode of On the Track. <laughs> Well, as all regular viewers know, I think, this is one of my favourite parts of the show. It's where Charlotte and I take a look at the news from Loch Ness and other lakes around the world that are reputedly haunted by monsters. And guess what, Charlotte? What? We don't have any amorphous blobs for you this time. Unfortunate. That's not unfortunate. Do you know why we haven't got amorphous blobs? Why? Because we've got some real news. We have some real, actual, convincing news for you from Loch Ness. Okay, first of all, last year a team headed by a zoologist from New Zealand, Professor Neil Gemmell, did a really interesting study at Loch Ness. They took water samples from various places in the lake and did DNA tests on them for what I believe is called environmental DNA. And they have come up with a species list of all the creatures that are living in Loch Ness, which from a environmental studies point of view is a really good thing, but a lot of people thought that they would then come up with the idea that there was a dinosaur living in Loch Ness and prove the Loch Ness monster's existence. Now, before we go any further, do you think they found a dinosaur? Nope. Well, technically they probably did, because there's quite a few species of water birds that live around there, and, water, and birds, as you know, are technically dinosaurs. All modern birds directly evolved from a group of carnivorous dinosaurs known as theropods. This suborder is characterised by hollow bones and three-toed limbs. During the Jurassic, birds evolved from small specialised theropods and are today the only known surviving dinosaurs represented by approximately 10,500 living species. All known theropods are bipedal, with the forelimbs reduced in length and becoming specialised. In modern birds, the body is typically held in an upright position, with the upper leg held parallel to the spine and with the forward force of locomotion generated by the knee. The really interesting um, evidence isn't what they found, it's what they didn't find. Because there are two theories which have been touted on and off for years for the existence of the Loch Ness Monster. That it could be a giant catfish, probably a Wells catfish, which is a European species, which has been introduced widely into different places in the UK, mostly um, starting in the 1860s when a peculiar organisation called the Acclimatisation Society introduced all sorts of foreign creatures to Britain. And some of them, as Richard and I discovered back in 2002, do grow to enormous lengths, but that's another story altogether. Now, lots of people have suggested that there is a Wells catfish living in Loch Ness, and other people for years have been suggesting that there are sturgeon in the lake, and sturgeon 
Get, get, uh, let's get all the um, political jokes out of the way first. Sturgeon are the largest freshwater fish in Europe, and they are occasionally found in British waters. And by the way, do you know something really interesting about sturgeon? What? Every sturgeon and any uh, whale or dolphin that is over six foot in length that washes up or is caught in British waters, do you know who it belongs to? The Queen? It belongs to the Queen, because one of the Queen's ancestors, and off the top of my head I think it was Henry VIII, but I wouldn't like to bet on that, I will look it up, but one of the Queen's ancestors liked sturgeon so much he made sure that any that were caught were his property. These days, um, any that are caught, if they're alive, they are usually released back into the water. If they're dead, it's the job of the local authority acting for the Queen to get rid of them. But that's the sidetrack. Are the sturgeon in Loch Ness? Apparently not. So the two very plausible ideas that the Loch Ness monster could be a giant um, catfish or a giant sturgeon have now been discounted. Now this is where it gets a bit irritating, because everybody for years has known that there are eels in Loch Ness. The European eel, Anguilla anguilla, is a very strange fish, although it's been of economic importance to the human race for thousands of years. It's only been very recently that we found out some of the details, some of the most important details of its um, bio biology. We don't really even know how big they grow. I had always been told that the European eel grew no, grew no bigger than just over four feet in length. But recently, Carl told me a story which totally changed my mind on that. Back in the late 1970s, my father John Marshall was working repairing a canal in Wooden Wowen in Stratford-upon-Avon when he found an enormous dead eel. The eel had been sucked into a pump that had been placed in the canal by Seven Trent Water and had unfortunately died. The eel was almost the width of the pipe that it had been sucked into and was according to my father approximately 7 inches in diameter and about 7 feet long. My father always told me that this eel was probably the most amazing and unexpected fish he had ever found. Everyone's always known that there are eels in Loch Ness and they're one of the most popular species there. But you would have thought that this was a complete mystery because ever since Neil Gemmell announced his results at a press release and said that although he had discounted several of the more popular theories behind the existence of the Loch Ness Monster, one still remained plausible and that was that it is a giant eel. The newspapers have been doing all sorts of ridiculous things. They've been saying, oh, the Loch Ness Monster doesn't exist, it's only an eel. And scientists prove there are eels in Loch Ness. And things like that, both of which are completely untrue. Yes, he's proved there are eels in Loch Ness, but we already knew that. He's also underlined the theory that Richard and I have been talking about for years, that the Loch Ness Monster may be a giant eel. But the newspapers have totally ignored the historical evidence behind the giant eel theory, and on the whole have been saying, oh, what a pity, the Loch Ness Monster it doesn't exist because it's not a prehistoric monster, it's only an eel. Well, when I was a boy, I went out fishing down the road at one of the, um, that, well, you know, where the big river crosses the road between here and Bradworthy. And I went out there with my mate David, and we caught an eel that was about, yay long, about 18 inches long. It bit me, and I still have a scar here, nearly 50 years later. And if an 18 inch eel can do that, and if an eel can grow anything up to say 12 or 15 feet. Can you imagine the damage that would do? That's a real, real monster. You don't have to go into the world of sci-fi in order to actually have a really monstrous, terrifying creature. But there's more. Is that? Yes. What is it? We have a video. A video which doesn't show a blob and actually appears to show a bloody great eel in the River Ness. 
Now, this is where it gets quite interesting because the fish, the eel was picked up on a trail camera. I didn't know you could get underwater trail cameras. That doesn't but, it doesn't surprise me. You no, know, it doesn't surprise me, but I just never thought of it. And this was a underwater trail camera run by a government body. It was a salmon, salmon company, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was a government body regulating the salmon fisheries in the area. And this camera has picked up what appears to be a reasonably sized brown trout and in the background an enormous eel swimming past. I'd like to say a big thank you here to the Ness District Salmon Fishery Board who have been kind enough to let us use this video. And I should also point out that they believe that the video is an optical illusion and actually shows a large stick floating off downstream in the, in the current of the river. And finally, look at the footage. Well, now we've enhanced it. I can see why the people from the Ness Salmon Fisheries Board think that it is a stick, but both Carl Marshall and I having looked at it many times, still believe that it shows undulations of a living creature and that it can only be an eel. And the best guess of the estimates of the size makes the eel eight and a quarter feet long, which is longer than any eel that has ever been known in Europe, any of this species. So that's one piece of exciting news. I'm a little bit um, concerned that they both turned up in the same week because, you know, you have all these old theories, all these old um, sayings about lightning never striking twice in the same place. But in my years as a 14 investigator, I found that quite often lightning does strike twice in the same place and all sorts of weird stuff does happen in clusters. So. Although, finally, once and for all, it's been proved that the Loch Ness Monster isn't a prehistoric reptile and it isn't a Greenland shark, why anybody really thought it could be either of these things uh, baffles me because they're both ridiculous suggestions. But it is now looking ever more likely that there are giant eels occasionally in some of the um, Scottish waterways and they are probably what is behind all the legends of the Loch Ness Monster. Over ten years ago the CFZ sent an expedition to South America to the country of Guyana. The expedition included Richard Freeman, John Hare, Dr Chris Clark and Paul Rose the reason that Paul, otherwise known as Mr Biffo, went along on this expedition is a long and complicated story and something for another time. But what were they looking for? During his famous expeditions into the Amazon jungle, famed British explorer Colonel Percy Fawcett reported sightings of many strange unheard of creatures. One of such was an enormous anaconda reported to be 65 feet long. It has been widely ridiculed by the scientific community ever since Fawcett's alleged 1907 encounter in western Brazil. Tales of an enormous snake often surface in native legends throughout the Amazon, and for as long as western explorers have dared to enter the green hell, accounts of the Yakumama, the mother of the water, have been plenty. The company had been paddling along in canoes as they made their way down the Rio Abuna River when according to Fawcett an enormous snake's head rose from the murky river. The huge reptile then swiftly made its way to the riverbank and after observing the animal's massive size Fawcett opened fire. After the beast was dispatched with a shot to the spine the snake was said to measure an incredible 62 feet in length much larger than any known snake in existence today. Fawcett also told of a number of similar unusual creatures during his adventures. One such creature was a strange dog with a double-barrelled nose that has since been discovered by explorer Colonel Blashford Snell 
and known as the Double Nose Andean Tiger Hound. If Fawcett's Double Nose Dog has since been proven to exist, what about his giant snake? 62 feet is twice as long as any known snake. Giant anacondas typically reach lengths of 17 feet in length, but are known to approach 30 feet. It remains to be seen whether Fawcett's 62 foot giant snake actually exists. Though the possibility of anacondas larger than the accepted 30 feet is almost certainly credible, someday the intriguing legends of the Yakamama, like Fawcett's double-nosed tiger hound, may be proven to be more than a myth after all. Though I think 62 feet might be a bit of a stretch. Back in the summer of 1982, which bloody hell that's 37 years ago, I picked up this young man hitchhiking because he looked interesting and had a guitar in his hand. 37 years later, we're still friends. This is my old mate, Mike Davis, who's probably the best songwriter I've ever met. And this is his new song called Why World. time to go over to Karina for our regular monthly visit to the Watcher of the Skies. Some people within cryptozoology believe that there are still dinosaurs on the Earth. Dinosaurs thrived in the warm temperatures and mild weather of the Mesozoic era. Then, one day, 66 million years ago, a huge meteorite crashed to Earth in what is now the Gulf of Mexico. All of a sudden, the earth became much colder and darker. Plants died and food became scarce, and three quarters of the creatures living on earth, including the dinosaurs, went extinct. But one group of dinosaurs survived, and they still survive today. Birds are descendants of theropod dinosaurs and have spread all across the globe. Some are tiny, some are enormous, and they're all sizes in between. I'm fascinated by these creatures, which is why John called me the Watcher of the Skies. I have been presenting Watcher of the Skies since the very early days of On the Track, and I'm still going to be doing it in the way I always have done, assisted and hindered by various cats and dogs, on On the Track Extra each month. 
but a change is as good as a rest, as someone or other said, and we thought we'd do something a little bit different for my segment of the main show. Back in August, Carl Marshall and his parents went to the Natural History Museum in South Kensington. I suppose I should really add London, England, for those of you who are not in this country, but are still watching the show. And he filmed all sorts of things of interest, including this. This is a great orc, a huge flightless seabird, which was hunted to extinction in the mid-19th century, with the last known sightings being in 1852 in Newfoundland. But although the creature is long gone, there are a number of fascinating aspects to its story. One of the most interesting aspects of phylogeny is a mechanism known as a parallel evolution, or sometimes convergent evolution. There are only a finite number of ecological niches, and it is fascinating to observe how, in wider geographical areas, species, often completely unrelated, have evolved in a strikingly similar way in order to do the same ecological job. The best example of this is, of course, Australia, where marsupials evolved to fill all the ecological niches that placental mammals did elsewhere in the world. The CFC totem, totem animal, the thylacine, for example, looked very similar to a member of the dog family, although it was completely unrelated. The probable extinct giant numeos of Madagascar are also involved. No, they're not involved in anything. They might be, might be involved in a gang somewhere. <laughs> The probably extinct giant lemurs of Madagascar are evolved to fill all sorts of ecological roles, including large quadrupeds and even something that probably resembled a gorilla. Something which is very interesting from a cryptozoological viewpoint is that one can hypothesize what animals could live in a specific area by comparing it with other, another similar area on the other side of the globe. This is tried and tested. For example, the giant elephant seals of the southern oceans are analogous to the walruses of the northern oceans and it has been hypothesized that the peculiar sea ape reported by explorer George Wilhelm Steller off the coast of Alaska in 1741 was an unknown aquatic mammal analogous to the ferocious leopard seals of the southern oceans. Steller was a remarkable naturalist who described many new species including Stella sea eagle and Stella sea cow, and so it would seem that it would be unlikely for him to have made the encounter up. Indeed, explorer Miles Smeaton saw something remarkably similar in the same location in 1969. Probably the most iconic birds of the Antarctic regions and those oceans surrounding it are penguins. These remarkable aquatic flightless birds have inhabited these areas for something up to 70 million years. But in the northern oceans, another group of seabirds, the orcs or alcids, have evolved to fill a very similar ecological niche. These birds include guillemots, puffins and murrelets. They are superficially similar to penguins, having black and white colours, an upright posture and many of the same habits. However, Apart from our friend the Great Orc, they could all fly above and below the surface of the water. The Great Orc was a massively specialised bird, and it was its specialisation that was its downfall. It bred on rocky, isolated outcrops in the waters of the North Atlantic, but they ranged as far south as northern Spain, and bones of this species have been found even in Florida, where it may have been present for a number of relatively short periods between 1000 BC and the 17th century, and fossils indicated that it once was even found in the Mediterranean. This bird was a food source for Neanderthals more than 100,000 years ago, but more recently it was hunted for food by Native Americans, who also venerated the birds as an important cultural symbol. A burial found in Newfoundland, which dates to about 2000 BC, was found surrounded by more than 200 great orc beaks, which are believed to have been part of a suit made from their skins, with their heads left attached as decoration. On our side of the Atlantic, they were also predated upon by humans, but were also killed for sport and out of sheer cruelty. 
The most disturbing reason for its extinction was that museums across Europe wanted to secure stuffed specimens before it got too late. One thinks of climate change as a relatively new phenomenon and of course anthropogenic climate change has only been taking place since the Industrial Revolution. But there have always been fluctuations in climate and one of the most well known is what has become known as the Little Ice Age which has conventionally been defined as a period between the 16th and 19th centuries when for a variety of reasons the Northern Hemisphere became particularly colder. Canals and rivers in Great Britain and the Netherlands were frequently frozen deeply enough to support winter festivals. The first River Thames Frost Fair was in 1608 and the last in 1814. The waters between Sweden and Denmark froze solid enough in 1658 that a Swedish army marched across the frozen sea to attack Copenhagen. It has been suggested that the Little Ice Age, rather than human depredations, is what finally delivered the coup de grace to the Great Hawk. The heavy freezing after the reasonably warm Middle Ages meant that Greenland for example, was entirely surrounded by ice, but Iceland was not as accessible as it had been. Because of its specialised needs, habitats for the Great Orc had always been few and far between, but the Little Ice Age made them even more difficult to find, and although the Northern Hemisphere had begun to warm by the time the bird became extinct, it was too late for it to recolonise its old hunting grounds. It has been suggested that the Great Orc would be a viable proposition for genetic resurrection. There are certainly enough specimens in museums and enough relatively close relatives to make some sort of biogenetic engineering a possibility, but is this a good thing? I really don't know. What do you think? Leave your answers in the comments below. If you want to read more about the Great Orc, it is covered in two books by CFZ Press author Glenn Baudry. Links to these books are in the description. Some months ago we talked about how Norwegian sailors had brought penguins back to the Arctic from their Antarctic home to try to introduce them. Some of the last reports of Great Orcs were actually of these translocated flightless birds. I hope you enjoyed this new approach to Water of the Skies, even though the Great Orc never actually left the ground or the ocean. It's now over to John for his regular look at new and Discovered species. Bye bye. New and Rediscovered is also changing. If you want to see the thing we've always done, but well, it will continue the way we've always done it in On the Track Extra. But, and this is a big but, New and Rediscovered on the main On the Track is going to be somewhat different. And it seems quite appropriate because my wife is a crazy cat lady and both my darling stepdaughters are crazy cat ladies to do my inaugural new and rediscovered on two recently rediscovered big cats. Enjoy. The stunning clouded leopard subspecies thought to have been extinct for the last 30 years has been spotted in southeast Taiwan. Officially declared extinct by zoologists in 2013 after not having been seen alive since the early 1980s, the Formosan clouded leopard Neophelis nebulosa brachiura attained cryptozoological status in 2018 after locals in southeast Taiwan's town of Darren Taitung reported seeing the extinct cat in the forest. In February 2019, Taiwan News reported two sightings by two different groups of rangers in Taitung County, both made in the summer of 2018. One report was of an individual climbing a tree and climbing a cliff in order to hunt mountain goats, while another was of an individual darting past a motorist on a road before retreating into a tree. According to the village chief, Kao Cheng Shi, Researchers are now working with the villagers to keep hunters away in an attempt to protect the animals and also to limit the destruction of their habitat. A previous 13-year camera trapping study by Zoo on a sink failed to find even a single clouded leopard, which, following excessive logging, forced the cats into the more mountainous regions. In 1989, 
the skin of a young individual was found in the Taroko National Park area, which was the last confirmed report. Pug marks reported in the 1990s near Yushan National Park were suspected, but were not confirmed to be those of a clouded leopard. The Tawa Mountain Nature Reserve is a protected area encompassing approximately 190 square miles. It harbours the largest remaining primary forest in southern Taiwan and comprises tropical and subtropical rainforest as well as temperate broadleaf and mixed forest and temperate coniferous forest. There is hope that this elusive big cat may have also migrated into this reserve. Ironically, owing to the relative rarity of reports of live forests and clouded leopards even before its alleged extinction, there was a hypothesis amongst a few researchers that the Formosan clouded leopard never existed, that the pelts frequently worn by indigenous communities were sunder clouded leopard pelts that were being traded between the sunder islands, China and Japan. Interesting, the same hypothesis has been used to explain the equally elusive Japanese leopard. The only evidence for the being a subspecies of the leopard endemic to Japan is the existence of several different pelts, and it has been hypothesized that those pelts were actually not from animals originally from Japan. And before we leave the subject of clouded leopards, this rediscovery in Formosa does give us hope that the legendary and at the moment purely hypothetical clouded leopard of the Japanese island of Iriomoti, which is already home to one very, very rare, unique species of cat, may eventually be found. But now it's time to go over to Africa. The Zanzibar leopard is a leopard population on Ungaja Island in the Zanzibar archipelago, Tanzania. It is the island's largest terrestrial carnivore and apex predator. In 2008, it was considered extinct due to prolonged superstitious persecution by local hunters. A leopard was recorded by wildlife biologist Forrest Galante using a camera trap thus renewing hopes for the population's survival. So, as Carl Marshall, who researched this, told me, the lesson, never say never. I would like to also point out that whereas every effort has been made to contact the copyright holders of these photographs, we believe that we are justified in reproducing them in this not-for-profit video using the policy of fair use. However, if there is anybody who believes that their intellectual or legal rights have been infringed, please contact us and we will do our best to bring the matter to a mutually acceptable solution. First there's this. And in the next month's episode, Next month, I haven't a clue what's in next month's episode, but I can tell you what's happening next week. You have the first of the On The Track Extras. And what's going to be in it? Well, you're just going to have to wait and see. Ha ha! Then there's this. Well, as I'm sure you've noticed, there's been a few changes this month. For once, John has listened to what we've had to say. We think they're quite good changes, but what do you guys think? Please tell us down in the comments. We hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed making it and, to quote that film that John quotes all the time... Hope you enjoy our new direction. Bye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's about it for this episode. Like Charlotte said, we really hope that you enjoy the new format and that you enjoyed watching this show as much as we enjoyed making it. I'm very excited by the way that we're going to be able to have on the track extras in between the regularly scheduled episodes of on the track because to use um, the current vernacular it means we're going to have more quality content for you out there in consumer land so i'll see you not just in a month's time we'll see you very soon 
for the next episode of On The Track Extra. So, until then, come here Archie, stop scratching. Until then, be seeing you. <laughs>